As you're finding your way back um, to your seats, I'm just going to give you this friendly little reminder right now before we even get kicked off and get started here. Whenever we're in this room and whenever someone is up here, that usually means that there's something incredible that we can all learn together. And so in order to do that the best way that we possibly all can, I'm going to ask you right now that if you have one of these, okay, go ahead and take it out. We all have it. Okay, we all have it. It's the 21st century, people. Go ahead and take it out. Turn it off. Okay, you can live without it for an hour. I promise the Wi-Fi in here isn't even that good, so don't even worry about it. Just turn it off. Put it under your chair. Put it in your pocket. Put it wherever you need to put it so it doesn't distract you. And also, if you're sitting next to somebody that you feel like is going to be a distraction, go ahead and move now. Okay, don't, don't be like, you stink. I don't like you. Just get up and slowly say, you know what, I just I feel like I really need to focus and all we're going to do is talk. So I'm going to get up and move right now. Okay, don't feel weird or embarrassed doing that. You can go ahead and do that right now if that's what you need to do. So during these times, it's really important in order to get the most out of them to sit up in your chairs, to listen up, to put every distraction underneath of your chair and listen the best that you can. Can we do that? Do you promise? Raise your hand and say, I promise. promise. Okay, I like it. Thank you very much. I like this a lot. So, tonight, how many of you guys, how many people in the room are sports people? Okay, do I have any sports people in this room? Yeah, I'm sure. A bunch of us like sports, okay? I, myself, really enjoy sports. And do any of you have something in life that really just kind of, like, shows your worst side a little bit? Like, shows a side that you're like... I didn't really want people to see that, but it just happened. There it is. It happened. Sports is my thing, okay? You can ask anybody from Cherryville, and they know Pastor Tori gets a little crazy during sports time, okay? I'm sorry. It's my problem. I'm competitive, and I know it, but at least I'm admitting my problem, right? At least that's the first step I I hear. That's the first step. So I'm doing a good job, right? I'm admitting that I have this problem, okay? I'm a little competitive, but I've been competitive in sports since I was a kid, okay? I I grew up playing soccer. That was like my thing. How many soccer people? Whoop, whoop. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. Soccer is the best sport, not going to lie, because it's competitive, right? You can go neck and neck. You got to run fast. You got to do all this stuff. You got to be aggressive, okay? It's awesome. Soccer is the best. I'll tell you this quick story, okay, because I'm really proud of this moment. But when I was about, like, 14, I played for the township, and you still play, and there's, like, boys and girls both on that team when you play in those kind of leagues. Yeah, you with me? So I was, here I was, this little 14-year-old, okay, small, smaller than I was now, okay, and there was this big kid. I played midfield, and so I was taking up the ball up the field like you're supposed to do, you know what I mean, out the, on the outside, doing my thing, doing a good job. All of a sudden, this huge boy out of nowhere decides to come over and try to get the ball away from me. I mean, he was doing his job, right? He was a defender. That's what, that's what they do. So he was doing his job. But my favorite thing is that he was twice my size, Okay, he was twice my size, yet I got the soccer ball away from him. And I'm just going to be real, I'm a little competitive, and I throw my elbows a little bit. That's not okay. Okay, don't do that. That's not okay. But I did it, and I got away with it. So I got around him, and his mom, if he wasn't embarrassed enough, his mom was on the sidelines right where that play took place, and she started yelling at the ref, ref, that girl, she did that. She's not allowed to do that. You're going to let her get away with that ref? Oh, my goodness. Like spazzing out for her son that was twice as big as I was. Are you getting the picture here? Like how many of you would be embarrassed if a girl just beat your butt and then your mom is whining about it for you, okay? Yeah, are you with me? You get it. It's kind of a little ridiculous. But what I'm really getting to is that right now my favorite sport is Frisbee. How many ultimate Frisbee players do we have in the house? That's what I'm talking about. Ultimate Frisbee is my favorite. But my least favorite thing in sports is when I'm making a goal and it gets rejected. The goalie catches it. I hate that for you goalies out there. That was my biggest, I hated it. I hated that. And in Frisbee, I hate it when somebody throws you this awesome throw 
and you ran. You ran down the whole field to catch it, and you go up to jump and catch it, and then all of a sudden a little ninja man comes out of nowhere and smacks it down right in front of you, and I'm like, no, bro, that was my play. Like, let it happen, okay? That was my moment, and you just came out of nowhere and smacked it out of my hands. Not okay. Rejected. Okay, you might as well yell that while you're hitting it down. You might as well yell, rejected, as you're throwing it, because it's what you do. That's what they do, and I hate it, okay? I hate that feeling. Are you with me? Do you get it? Yeah, it's the worst, or it's even worse when I throw and throwing, okay, throwing good passes are not my strong point, so when I throw a good one, I'm really proud of myself, and I got, get really mad when somebody rejects that pass, okay, because I'm like, no, that was good, let them catch that, stop hitting it out of the air, okay, I hate that, stop pushing it away, but it happens, and if, if this is a funny video, I want to show you guys this funny video, if you're not with me, if you still haven't caught the vision of rejection and how horrible it is, for your, your winning goal to be rejected or your winning um, frisbee toss to be rejected. Here's this video that should help you understand a little bit more of the feeling of rejection. Go ahead, roll that. All right, that's the fifth floor problem. Okay. Mountain Mahas. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy, how happy are folks who save hundreds of dollars switching to Geico? Happier than to campaign with Tembo blocking a shot. <laughs> Get happy. Get Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. So there it is. Rejection at its finest. Wasn't that pretty good? Okay, I don't remember that commercial, but I found it the other day, and I was like, this is hysterical. I got to show them this. It's pretty good. But rejection, being rejected, is not the most fun thing in the world, right? But... I'm not going to stand up here tonight and talk about how we've all been there, done that, felt the pain of rejection. Instead, I want to talk to you guys tonight at a, different, a little different angle and talk about how each and every single one of us in here at one point in time in our lives, for some reason or another, has rejected the love of God has totally rejected the love of God, totally walked away from it, totally ignored it, just walked away, rejected the love of God. I googled in preparation for this message, always go to Google, just kidding, don't always go to Google, but Google does sometimes have some good stuff, and I was thinking, I want to know what do people in this world think the love is? That's a good question, right? So I googled, what is love? And what came up wasn't actually even, like, definitions of love. What actually came up was that um, articles saying how many different times people have searched the question, what is love, on Google. Okay? I'm like, that's not really helpful, but it's still kind of very interesting. So I read this article, and it talked about how what is love, that question, is in the top ten questions that get searched on Google. Isn't that pretty crazy? In 2011, it was the number one most asked question put into the Google search engine. 2012, welcome to America, it changed because number one was what is twerking? Like, that's important. Thank you, Miley Cyrus, okay? So we're just going to ignore that year. But then in 2013, again, number three on the most what is questions that are asked on Google. And so that, that got me thinking. That got me thinking that probably, possibly, the number one reason why people in this world, that it's easy for us in this room to reject God's love is because we don't even get, we don't even understand what that love is or what that love even looks like. Because, see, to me, I, I think that there are two different definitions of love going on in this world, in this battle that we're all going through of what is love. I think there's an earthly love, that 
Hollywood and the movies and the music and Taylor Swift and all of those people are really good about writing about and talking about and singing about and making movies about. You have this earthly love that's all, oh, you're cute and oh, you're funny and oh, you're all these things that are like fluffy and pink and flowers. And you have that type of love, okay? And then there's this love that I like to call heavenly love, which is spotless and sinless and perfect and holy. And that only comes from Jesus. And so I think we all in this room think that we have a good understanding of love. So many of you maybe came this week thinking, what can love? I know how to do that. I'll just go to hang out and have like really good food in the cafeteria. Not. But do we really understand what love is? How many of us in here made that Google statistic that met the top 10 what is questions? How many of us, of us in here fit that? How many of us in here have done that? And so I think it's easy for us to reject God's love because we don't understand that love to begin with. When I was a kid, I grew up in a family that always said, um, I love you. I know today that I can be really thankful for that, and that's a huge blessing because I always heard the phrase, I love you, when I, wh when I went to bed at night, when I woke up in the morning, when I left the house to go somewhere, or if I was on the phone with somebody in my family, I always heard, I love you. So I grew up thinking, like, I know exactly what this means. I hear it all the time. People tell it to me all the time. I know exactly what this is. And then in high school, it kind of became a different story. Okay, that's where some of you guys are at. And I started realizing that the earthly definition of love kind of started shaping my brain and how I felt loved and how I felt like I needed to be loved by other people and how I felt like I needed to love other people. It was slowly starting to be developed from this earthly love, this false love this love that is empty. And so it wasn't until my junior year of college, I'm just going to be real with you guys, my junior year of college was a very, very difficult year for many different reasons. But it was very difficult. It was very challenging. And even in that, that year, I felt like God wanted to teach me something incredible. But I was so broken that I was like, I don't even want to think about what that is right now. Until one night, on Wednesday night, we have church. Um, at college, I would go to church with my friends on a Wednesday night. And I was sitting there, and we were singing songs about God and about his love, much like Yui sang earlier tonight. And I remember, I don't even remember what the song was, because this is crazy how God works. But I don't even remember what the song was, but I remember getting to the chorus, and it was about God's love and who he was and how much he loved me. And as, as I started getting closer to singing that, all of a sudden, I had this weird feeling that was like, ooh, do you really understand my love? Do you really understand how much I love you? Do you really see how much I love you? And in return, do you really know how to love me? Do you really know how to love my people? And so that entire year, it was kind of crazy that God kind of gave me this wake-up call of wanting me to just really sit in his love, to accept, fully accept his love and whatever came with that. And so since my junior year of college, I just have been learning, and even still to this day, what God's love looks like and what that compels us to do. And it is incredible. And so tonight I want to talk to us about why we reject God's love. I think the number one reason it's easy for us to reject God's love or to just throw it away or to not feel like we're worthy of accepting it is because we're using our sin as an excuse. We think, I, oh, I am so sinful. I am such a sinful human being. God, do you even know me? Do you know what I've done? Do you know where I've been? Do you know what I think about? 
Do you know that I lie to people all of the time? You know that I basically just cheat on all my homework and all my papers and all my tests just to get through school, just to get a good grade? Do you know that I do that? Do you know that I, I'm disrespectful to my parents and I'm rude to my parents and I'm mean to my siblings? God, I have so many things in my life. I have so much sin in my life. How could you possibly love me? I am a wretched, broken human being. How could you possibly love me? And so I think some of us are stuck in believing that our sin needs to keep us from accepting the love of Jesus. But you want to know what's pretty incredible? Is that in Romans 5, 8, it says, For God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Before we were even born, God sent his only son, Jesus, to die on our behalf to give us the opportunity for eternal life. Did you catch that? While we were still sinners. While we were still lost in our sin, while we were still broken in our sin, Jesus came. For us in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, it says, It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. This gift only comes from God. I think it's pretty incredible. If you read the New Testament, if you read the Gospels, you will see that Jesus didn't come for all the people that had their lives together. Okay, Jesus didn't come for the people that were already perfect, that were already whole, that are already mended up. Jesus came for the lost. Jesus came for the broken. Jesus came for the weary. Jesus came for the sick. Jesus came for the sinners. That is why he walked this earth. That is why he came down from heaven, taking on the form of a man, to come and meet the needs of sinful, broken, lost people. So if you're sitting here and you think that the only reason that is holding you back from accepting God's love, accepting his gift, from accepting his gift of grace and mercy and sacrifice is your sin, then you're exactly where you need to be in order for Jesus to save you. Jesus said, the healthy people don't need a doctor. The sick people need a doctor. Jesus came to save the sinners. You can't use your sin as an excuse to keep you rejecting the love of God. Another reason I think a lot of us, it's easy for a lot of us to reject the love of God is that we feel like we have to prove we are lovable. Okay, me, take you back to my glory days of high school. Just kidding. Um, I, no, those were not glory days. Okay, you guys, this is glory days for you, maybe. But for me, it was not. Okay, so take you back those times. I was one of these people that felt like I needed to be proved, that I needed to prove to other people that I was worth their love, that I was worth their time, that I was worth them loving me. I was one of those people, okay? I have, if you know me, okay, I have a pretty, and I'm okay admitting this, crazy, ridiculous, out there, loud, whatever, personality, okay? I like to have fun, and I'm okay with that. But in high school, I would almost take it to the next level, okay? Almost take it to the completely next level. I was like, oh my word, if these people are going to like me, I got to be up here. And so I was one of those people that if you made a joke, I'd laugh 10 times louder at it because it was really, really funny. If you were one of those people that were like over here in your own little world talking to your own little people, I'd be like over here talking even louder about my stuff just so you heard me, just so you thought I was cool, okay? And just so you'd want me to be your friend and think I was cool and we could hang out and all those kind of stuff, okay? That was me, 
Okay, I was one of those people that for some reason I thought if I was even louder, if I was even more obnoxious, if I laughed even louder, talked even more, whatever, the people were going to like me. Okay, they would think I was cool and they'd want to be my friend. And so I felt like I was always proving that I was worth people's love, that I was worth people's time, that they could love me. I didn't just think that I could just like be myself in order for people to love me. Like, no, I gotta, give, I gotta give them a reason to love me. I gotta give them a reason for them to be my friend, to feel like I'm worth it. And maybe some of you are like that. And maybe some of you think of God in the same way that we have to prove that we're worth his love. That we have to be funny, that we have to be smart, that we have to be stylish or witty or cute or skinny or buff or get straight A's all the time or just the perfect poster child all the time or whatever it is, whatever your thing is, maybe some of us are stuck in this lie that we have to prove to God that we are worth his love, that we are worth his time. But the Bible tells us that we don't have to prove a thing. Because in 1 John 4, and if you get the chance to read that entire passage, it's an incredible passage. And in 1 John 4, 9 through 10, it says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This verse says that this is real love. Jesus didn't do what he did because we could love him first. Jesus was going to die on the cross. Jesus was going to offer us his love whether we loved him back or not. He was still going to do that. And I think this is where that earthly love creeps in a little bit, right? Because in my brain, I'm thinking, Jesus, if I was Jesus, I'd be like, ooh, this person's not going to love me, and this person's not going to love me, and this person's not going to love me, so I'm not going to die for them because hopefully it'll hurt a little less, and I don't want to go through this much pain if all these people aren't going to love me or like me or whatever. But Jesus didn't do that. Jesus didn't pick who he was dying on the cross for. Jesus came to the earth, died on the cross, and offered every single human being his perfect love for acceptance. Jesus loved us before he even knew if we would love him back. I just, I just want that to sink in. Just think about that. Because this love, it's easier for us to get stuck in this earthly love of, man, that guy, he's a real jerk to me. I'm not going to love him back. Why would I love the person that bullies me? Why would, I, why would I love the person that spreads rumors about me? Why would I love the person that gossips about me? Why would I love the person that cuts me off in the Walmart line? Hate Walmart, my word. Get it together, people. Open all your lines. Anyways, that's besides the point. But why would I love them? They give me absolutely no reason to love them. They give me absolutely no reason to show them love. But that's not Jesus' love. That's not heavenly love. That's not perfect love. Love, because Jesus' love says, I'm going to love every single person, no matter what they do, no matter what they say, no matter how much they hurt me, even if they reject my love, I am still going to love them, because that was my purpose, that was God's plan, for me to show love to all humanity. So I think that is a pretty incredible thing. I think the third reason why it's easy for us to reject God's love, to not accept his love in any way, shape, or form, is because some of us ourselves are afraid of being rejected. We've all been there. We've all done that. 
We've all felt the pain or seen the pain from rejection and what that looks like. We felt the rejection from our parents' divorce. We felt rejection when our parents walked out on us and they never came back. We felt rejection when our friends have walked out on us and found cooler people to hang out with. We felt rejection when our friends tell other people things that were only ever supposed to be the two of us. We feel rejected when the people that were supposed to love us the most and the people that we thought loved us the most turned their back and just walked out on us. We have all felt rejection. We have all, every single one of us in this room, I am sure, have seen rejection or has felt the pain of rejection. And because we struggle, because some of us maybe struggle with this insecurity of rejection, we feel like God is going to do the same thing to us. God, if all of these people in my life that were supposed to love me the most, my parents or my friends, but they walked out on me, they turned their back on me, they've rejected me, why wouldn't you do the same thing? I'm not worth it, I'm not perfect, I couldn't live up to their standards, I couldn't be the person that they wanted me to be, so they rejected me. God, why would you be any different? So we fear because of our fear of earthly love's rejection. We reject God's perfect heavenly love because we feel like he's going to do the same thing. Can I tell you that he is not? Can I tell you that it's not even possible? Can I tell you that when Jesus came and died on the cross for our sins and offered us this gift of love, that he was never, ever going to take it back? God can't contradict his character. And his character, the Bible tells us, is love. God is love. That's who he is. He can't take that away. He can't take that away from us. He has already given it to us. Earlier we sang the song, How He Loves. I think that song is incredible. It holds such incredible truth and has such an incredible story behind it. But when I was thinking about this tonight, I was thinking about the first verse when it talks about he is jealous for me that he loves like a hurricane and I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy and when I think about God's love I think about this picture I think about this word picture I think about this tree okay if you've ever seen a tree in a storm which you have we're all human we've been alive for thunderstorms they happen or hurricanes these trees they can't go anywhere right They're just there, and they have to put up with the heavy winds, and they have to put up with the heavy rain, and they just, they're there. They're just there. They can't get away from it, and these winds and this rain is just pounding on them, constantly pounding on them, constantly there throughout this entire storm, but it can't leave. It can't do anything. It's a tree. It's rooted there. It stays there. Can't run away. Can't find shelter. It's just there, and I like to think sometimes When I sing this song, I like to think of that word picture of God's love, how it is always there. We can try to get away from it. We can try to run away from it. We can try to reject it and push it away as much as we want. But the reality of the fact is that it is always there. It is always there, like that ridiculous wind and that ridiculous rain in the middle of a storm. You just want it to be over, but it's there. God's love is always there for us. In Romans 8, 30 through 39, it says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels or demons, neither the present or the future, or any powers, or the height or depth, or anything else in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of the Lord. I think every single one of us in here have struggled with one of these things at one time 
or another because it's really easy for us to take that definition of that earthly love, that earthly love that is warped and is sinful and is just empty and it's lonely and all these things that we just, we try to fill our hearts with all these different things and pull from so many different areas in order to feel loved and fill our hearts with love and all this kind of stuff, but at the end of the day, it's just empty. I think we take all those situations of our earthly love and apply it to our relationship with God. But it doesn't work because it's the complete opposite. I think it's easier for us to reject God because we drag all of this negative stuff from our earthly relationships into our heavenly relationship with God. And that's not the truth. Our relationships with human beings, we're sinful creatures, right? We're sinful creatures. We're not perfect. We're going to mess up. We're going to do the wrong things. It happens. That's life. We're people. But sometimes I think we take that baggage and that scar, those scars, and we apply it to our relationship with God. When God's saying, my relationship with you looks completely different. My love for you is completely different. My love for you is heavenly. My love for you is perfect. My love for you is spotless. My love for you is sinless. My love for you is whole and complete, and it fulfills you. That is my love for you. No earthly love will ever come close to God's heavenly love for you. And you're sitting there, and you're still thinking, I don't really know how this is going to apply to my life. I still don't really know. I've tried accepting God's love, and it still, it still re- wasn't really, I felt like it wasn't enough. I felt like it didn't really change me. I feel like it didn't really move me. I want to tell you this story about my friend in college um, when he was about, This is like going way back in the day. He comes from a really big family, and his dad um, was a pastor, and his mom was an awesome lady. They were both parents that loved God and loved people with all of their hearts, with everything they had in them, and they would literally do anything for anyone. And my friend, he was exactly like that, and he had a lot of siblings, and they were all like that. They were just awesome people because they loved God, and they loved other people, and they would do anything for you. Like I said, my friend's dad was a pastor, and so he went out to his job. He went out to do his daily duties, whatever he was doing that day. But that day, his mom got a phone call about how her husband, about how my friend's dad, how he was never coming home. Because while he was out and about, just minding his own business, doing his own thing, some random guy just decided that he was going to take his life. And he killed him. And so the mom's husband never came home that day. The kid's dad never came home that day. And they had to live with this pain that someone had murdered their father. They had to live with the emotions and the feelings that came from that incident. And so as time passed and and their wounds, they started to figure out how to deal with things and, and move on as a family and come around each other and love one another and get support by their church and their friends and their family on how to move through this, how to deal with this, how to process this. One day, the wife decided that she wanted to go and she wanted to meet the man that had murdered her husband. So she went, and she went to the prison where this guy was, and she went in, and she had this conversation with this man. Obviously, I wasn't there. But from hearing this story, it basically went a little bit like she sat down with him, And she said, you have caused my family a lot of pain. You've caused my family a lot of hurt. You took away my husband. You took away my kid's father. He's never coming back. They will never have that. You took that away. But I came here today 
to tell you that I've forgiven you. I've forgiven you for all the pain you've caused. I've forgiven you for killing my husband. And through the conversation, the man obviously posed the question, what in the world would make you forgive someone like me? I murdered your husband. I am a horrible person. I have never, never done anything right in my life. Why in the world would you spend your time coming down here to tell me that you've forgiven me? She looked at him and she said, I can forgive you and I can love you because Jesus first loved me and has forgiven me. When my friend first told me that story, I could not believe that someone could understand and know the love of the Lord that powerfully to be able to go to the man who murdered her husband and tell him that she had for truly forgiven him and she loves him because God has forgiven him and God loves him. And it's incredible because that man was a murder, murderer. He was full of sin. He had never done anything right in his life. But that day, he accepted Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior because that woman went and forgave him and showed him the love of Jesus. The love of Jesus will move mountains. The love of Jesus will change lives like nothing you have ever seen before. Jesus' love is like no other love. We know the truth about God. You know the truth about his love. No, to know love is to know God because 1 John 4, 16 tells us that God is love. If you want to know God's heavenly, true, perfect, spotless, sinless love, you need to know God. And in order to know God, you must embrace his love. You must embrace Jesus' love. You must embrace his sacrifice for us. Because Jesus knows exactly how to love every single one of us. He will never disappoint you. He will never leave you. He will never turn his back on you. His love is constant. His love is perfect. His love is always there, and he wants you to embrace it. He wants you to accept it. The night that Jesus was betrayed, he was in the garden, and he was praying, God, if there's any other way that I can do this, if there's any other way that I can go through this, please, just can you, can, can, whatever your will is, but does it have to be this way? And God reminded him, yes, this is the way I planned it. This is my perfect will. This was my perfect plan for you, that you would come and that you would come for the lost, that you would come for the sick and the hurting, and that you would die on a cross for every single one of their sins. That was the purpose of Jesus. That was the plan of Jesus' life to come to offer salvation, to show us his love. When we embrace someone, when we're excited to see somebody, when you love somebody, at least this is what I do, I like to give them a hug, right? Okay? I like that. I like hugs. When I think about hugs, when I think about this embrace, when I think about when you love someone, you show them you love them by giving you a hug, I think about Jesus. And I think about Jesus' death on the cross and his arms spread out open wide. He was hanging there saying, I want to embrace you. His arms stretched out 
wide, saying, come to me, accept my love, embrace me. I will give you love. I will give you something that you have never had before, and it will change your life. We need to embrace his love. What you're going to learn over the next couple weeks is really, in the end, not going to set in. It's not really going to have much meaning if you don't first wrap your brain around the fact that God wants you. He wants you right where you're at. He wants you right where you're at, where you're broken, where you're hurting, where you feel like you're not perfect, where you feel like you're not good enough. He wants you right where you're at. And every single one of us is offered this gift of love. And he wants us to accept it. He's on the cross with his arms open wide saying, I want to embrace you. I want to accept you. I want you to accept this love that I have so freely given to every single one of you. And so this week, As you go into these different messages, you're going to have a lot of awesome messages coming your way. Soak them in. Listen to them. Learn what it means to walk in love. How you take Jesus' love, how you take accepting his love, and how you apply that to every other area of your life. But in order to do that, you first have to start here. This is where it starts. You need to know God. You need to embrace his love. You need to accept his gift. Stop running for it from it. Stop waiting. Stop putting it off. Stop saying, oh, I'll do that when I'm like 17 or 25 or 31 when I'm an adult and I'm old and I'm weird. Don't wait for that. Jesus wants us to accept that now. And so this is what we're going to do. In a couple minutes, the band, a couple seconds, really, the band is going to come up, and they're just going to play a song. And while they're doing that, they're just going to play a little bit. I want you guys to be thinking. I want you guys to be searching your hearts. This is your moment with God. This is your moment to hear from him. How is he challenging you to accept his love? What is your wake-up call? Is he waking you up? Is he trying to get your attention? What do you need to do in order to accept his love tonight? So I want you guys to think about it. I want you guys to close your, head, <laughs> close your eyes, bow your heads. If you need to go out in the hallway, if you need to go outside, tell a, a counselor that's where you're going. You need to be out there. You need to be by yourself. But I just want you to get alone. Okay, this is your moment. It's not about your neighbor. It's not about your friend. It's not about whatever else that you're thinking about. Okay, put all that stuff aside because this is so very important. God loves you, the end. I wish that I could have gotten up here and literally just said that because that's the truth. But that's all I had to say. God loves you. Just accept it. Just embrace it. Know that that is truth. And nobody can ever take that away from you. Nobody. You yourself can't even take it away from you. It's already offered. It's already been given. He wants you to accept it. So go ahead. Take this time. Be alone. Quiet your hearts. Quiet your minds. And I want you to focus. Get out your journals. Go out in the hallway, like I said. Do what you need to do in order to focus your heart right now on accepting the love of Jesus.
maybe some of you maybe some of you tonight haven't even taken that first step of just saying Jesus I am a sinner Jesus I I'm I'm still lost I'm still I'm still broken I haven't even asked you to come into my life and make me whole and if that's you tonight if you just need to take that step and proclaim that Jesus is Lord and that you want him to rule and reign in your life, then I want you to pray this prayer with me tonight. There's nothing magical in the prayer. There's nothing special about the prayer, but it's about what's in your heart and the decision that you are making with God. And so if you've never taken this step before, I want you to pray this with me in your heart and your mind. Just say, Dear God, I know that I... I'm a sinner. But God, even though I am broken, even though I am empty, and even though I have nothing to offer you, God, I know that you have everything to offer me. And so God, right now, I accept your gift. I accept your sacrifice Jesus, come into my life. Make me whole. Make me new. Jesus, I love you, and I believe in you, and I believe in what you did for me on the cross, because you love me. Amen. If you guys prayed that prayer tonight for the first time, you can keep your heads bowed. Keep your eyes closed. Okay, if you pray that prayer for the very first time tonight, I want you to go ahead and just raise your hand. Nobody looking around. Nobody looking around. Just raise your hand if this is the first time you prayed that tonight. And if you did, I want you to go and I want you to tell a leader. Okay, I want you to tell a sponsor. I want you to tell a pastor, whoever it is. Tell someone what you just did because that is incredible and you have a reason to celebrate. And we want to celebrate with you. And then for the rest of you, I want you to pray, God, help me accept your love. God, show me how I need more of you, more of your love in my life in order to be the person that you've created me to be. Not who everybody else wants me to be. Not what I think I have to be. But who, what is your love creating me to look like, shaping me to be? Dear God, I thank you for every single person in this room. Lord, none of us are here this week on accident. God, none of us are here just because. God, every single one of us are in this room for a specific reason. And so, God, I pray that you would just reach into the lives of everyone in this room tonight, God. And, God, that this week that you just continue to speak into our lives, continue to just be real to us, continue to show yourself to us, continue to show us your love so that we might know how to walk in love better, that we might know how to show this broken world what love truly looks like. God, we love you and we thank you for who you are and for everything that you are doing in this place tonight. And it's in your name I pray. Amen.